Welcome to the Soul Seeker Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Kabert, and this year marks the fifth birthday of the Soul Seeker Podcast. I started this pod back in 2019 when I was taking my first steps on the path of remembering. And at the time, the tagline for the show was a journey of self discovery. A year later, it became a journey of remembering. Yet, what I know now is back then I was still seeking. And what I've come to know now is that it's the journey of seeking that brings us the silent, slow stillness of acceptance. And therein lies our own innate wisdom. It's my mission now to eradicate the glorification of hustle culture, as it was my drive in entrepreneurship that led to a greater whole. And that's because I was outsourcing my sovereignty rather than looking within. So let this be your invitation to take a deep breath in and remember that at any time we can shift our thoughts and our feelings to create the outer world in which we wish to live. Soul Seekers, it's time to grow. Let's go. All right, we're going to start here with some deep breaths. So if you're listening to this and you're driving or you can't close your eyes for whatever the reason may be, just feel free to breathe with us with your eyes open. Otherwise, listeners and Tina, for myself as well, we'll start to shut down the eyes, straightening the spine, feeling our feet on the floor, and through the nose, inhaling all the way up, sipping in a bit more air at the top. Hold the breath through the mouth. Exhale, let go. Another slow inhale through the nose all the way up. Sipping in a bit more air at the top. Holding the breath, rolling back the eyes as if you were looking at the third eye. And through the mouth, audible exhale, let it go. Last one yet, biggest inhale yet. Inhaling all the way up. Sipping in a bit more. Sipping a bit more. Hold the breath, roll back the eyes. Just feeling. And through the mouth, exhale, let it go. Let it go. Flickering the eyes back open. Here we are. Santina Louise also goes by Tina because it's a little bit or easier to say sometimes than the full thing. I am so stoked to have you here and shout out to Christina Garza for introducing us. Yeah, thank you for that. And uh, Tina's new book, Empowering Truth Bombs, 250 Powerful Words of Wisdom, not just for women, y'all. No, there's so much goodness in this book. Tina, thank you for so much for being a guest on the Soul Seeker podcast. Hi, Sam. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. And yes, thank you so much to Christine, um, my girl. So she's awesome. Yeah, uh, very cool. So tell me a little bit more about how this book came to be. Sure. I, uh, I've always believed in the one degree shift theory that... If a person shifts their perspectives or their beliefs one degree, all it takes one degree, they end up somewhere completely different in essence, changing the course of their life. And uh, all the books that I'm going to be writing, so I have five more behind this. Wow. Theory. Yes. All of the theory, just little shifts, whether that be, um, like I said, a belief or perspective, a way that they're being treated at home, the work, how they treat themselves. It could be knowing how to react to a situation or setting boundaries about what they'll allow in their lives. Those are all huge, huge issues, but yet a tiny little shift, which people, I don't think, may have to be so wrong on this, but they think it's too simple. You know, they have to do something huge and big and and yet the simplest little things get from this book get stuck in my mind constantly. And I, I'm put in a situation and I go, 
oh yeah, I know how to handle this one. And I had three of them this morning and it's been a lot of fun. I get sent pictures constantly from people. This is my favorite, or I, I was able to use this one yesterday. And so that's basically the premise of how the book came to me. I wanted to create little shifts. And tell us a little bit about your background, like uh, the behind the scenes of your life that led to the writing of this book. Unique background. I have, I am purely center brain. So I have a creative side and I have an analytical side. So most of my jobs have been in male dominated industries. I was in the CIA. I was in commercial real estate. I'm trying to think the military. And they've all been male dominated industries. And as a woman, you really need to walk that fine line. I mean, it's the line if you're too rigid, then, you know, you get the B word. And I don't know how you feel about people cussing on your, your podcast. Feel free. Feel free. Okay. You get labeled the bitch. If you are too rigid, too hardcore, yet if you're, if you don't get right to that line, then you're just a female. And you know, they treat you like one, especially in the military. I'll forget about it. And uh, so I have found that I needed to figure out how to walk that little, you know, line of which way do I go and try to be accepted. And it, it was tough. It was absolutely tough. But I've also been on a spiritual path for about 47 years now. I figured it out the other day. I'm like, oh, my word, I started when I was 12. Mm -hmm. And... I've been able to really pull from that side for many, many years. So that is kind of my background. It's unique in that also as a, I was a professional photographer for many years and I hid behind my camera because that was a much safer place to be is behind that camera than in front of it or talking to people and having deep conversations when my deep conversations are a lot different than most whole deep conversations. <laughs> hundred percent. Yeah, no, I get that. So when you were 12, you started to walk the path of spirituality. What did that look like for you? I had to sneak behind my mother's back, her best friend, who I consider my first teacher and my aunt, my aunt Fran. She has I have an aunt Fran. No way you do not. Yeah, I'm going to see her in a month for the first time since, I don't know, maybe six years it's been. It's been a while. Yeah. Um, so anyways, please continue. Fran, yes. And I would go to my aunt Fran who was doing the wildest things I had ever seen. And I started asking her behind the scenes, what can I start doing? And then won't get me in trouble. Because obviously, like I said, my mom was against it. And Fran started me with, let's just start with a ball of light energy. Let's just do it. As you've seen many, many people do with the, the ball of light between your hand and Let's, let's feel it. Let's grow it. And, um, and, um, I took that quickly to a whole different place because she was explaining, you can take that ball of light and you make it bigger and you can get inside of it. And then you're protected. You can take it. You could put it around your car and you're protected in your car, in a plane, in a anywhere you are, wrap it in this white light. I started doing that. But mm -hmm. then. Kid, you get bored, and I'm like, what else can you do with the white light? And I'd get on the highway with my mom, and every car that passed, I would see them getting a piece of the white light until everybody on the road had white light, and they were all in their own bubbles. And then I would kind of back away and start seeing the street from a much higher perspective, and the whole street would be lit up. And you back away even further. And to the point I was in the universe looking down on the earth and the whole bubble was going around the earth. And I'd say for that moment, the earth was safe. Hmm. I did that all the time. I finally told her about it. She's like, seriously? All right. Uh, and not to go too, uh, we, 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 so many people like to call it, but the day came when I heard, why do you stop at the earth? Hmm. I thought, what does that mean? Why do I stop at the earth? And the voice said, why don't you turn and give it to the universe? The universe needs it too. And that was kind of a major eye opener. So that's when I started interacting more, uh, I guess, on a 
higher plane. Yeah, yeah. So that was and, my beginning. And we're here for all the woo. I mean, this is the Soul Seeker podcast. Sometimes, you know, some topics will be a little bit more uh, grounded in basic, as I call it, mindfulness, like basic mindfulness versus uh, really getting out there to your point. So when you start to expand more beyond the earth and like getting into the universe, as you're putting it, what would that look like? Oh, this is where you're like, oh, maybe this is something I don't want to share. No. I know. No, she, now I have to go back to my book. I am not going to slouch to make others feel comfortable. That is one of them. And I have to keep reminding myself of that, that it's okay. These are my experiences. And like you said, we're on the Truth Seeker podcast, so... I'm going to go for it. And if you choose, whatever you choose, I understand. So um, the day came when uh, she Fran taught me how to have my own dragon. She is a dragon. Um, she's a dragon um, elf, which she taught me how to view elementals. I can see them around me at all times uh, in human form. So, but I don't know if they have interacted with humans in the past or if it's just how I get to see them. But she is from the Elfin clan and she is a dragon. Um, I'm not sure what you call them. Dragon Blader, Dragon Writer, Dragon Lover. But uh, she explained to me how to get my dragon. I went through the process, which wasn't that hard. Anybody can do it. And I met my dragon, Chica. And Chica and I fly. Chica takes me wherever I'm needed. And I have a type of energy that I give to wherever I go. I have been to the Amazon. I've been to the moon. I've been to other planets. And if the beings there, I just go wherever it's needed. I, I started working with that energy with all the mountains here in Salt Lake. Because I have become friends with the spirit of the land here. I've become friends with the spirit of the mountain. And every mountain range has its own spirit. So I've been introduced to them. I've given them all energy. They've allowed me to interact and join meetings, which if you ever want to hear a story about a meeting that was kind of mind blowing, I can tell you, or if I'm getting too far off track. No, this is perfect. Yeah. Keep going though. Yeah. Yeah. Please. This is amazing. All right, guys. Um, so. If if Rocky is his name, Rocky is the big mountain behind me here. And if Rocky needs me, I just literally will fall into meditation. I get called and I go. And he was waiting for me this one time. And he said, come on, come on, come on. We got to go. We got to go. And Rocky's massive. And uh, sometimes I can make myself as big as he is. But this time he just grabbed me, put me on his shoulder. And we walked about five steps. We were across the the valley going into a mountain range over there and uh, there was a meeting going on and I saw the spirit of the Great Salt Lake there. I saw all these mountain ranges. There were uh, elders and I overheard them saying to the Salt Lake, they said if you don't take it then it will go downtown Salt Lake and it will harm many humans. We need you to take it. I f she said, that's no problem but the wind is going to have to help me. And so they said It'll be done. And I didn't know what they were talking about. It, I never quite know until something happens. And it was about two days later, there was a chemical plant explosion on that mountain range. And in the news, there's, I'm watching the news about it, which I don't do very often. I don't, I don't like that energy of the news. And um, they said that the chemical, when the power plant exploded, the chemicals went into the air. And thank God that the wind took them over the Great Salt Lake because if the wind had shifted and taken the chemicals downtown Salt Lake, the mm. people that were working would have all had their lungs burned. But instead, the Salt Lake took I was blown away because, like I said, I have no idea what they're talking about until it, something happens. When, that, thank you for sharing that. Was that when you were little or a little bit oh. older? I've only lived in Salt Lake for six years. Okay, so that was recent. Got it. It was. Um, I've also learned that when I was younger, it was held back from me because I think when kids have too much spiritual knowledge, 
they don't fit in and I already didn't quite fit in. So I'm, I'm kind of, I am glad my mom held me back from that. From what I have learned, she is one of my guides and was holding me back on purpose so that I would not get into this world too early and really distance myself from people in general. Mm -hmm. The actual, more of my work started when I was about 18. And uh, Fran, of course, was there to teach me how to speak to spirit and to um, ask questions and get answers. That was a lot of fun. It's amazing. Yeah. And, you know, with all of this, we say like, oh, it's woo or it's woo woo, you know, and that's such a defense mechanism because like you and I are both here for it and I'll have, you know, as well, like the listeners of this podcast are here for it, right? You know, like if, if you're randomly stumbling on this podcast for the first time and you don't know Tina, you just randomly found it, like you're probably still, you found it for a reason. So I think every single person listening to this can resonate and understand what we're speaking about. And so many different things are coming up for me. The first thing I'll speak about is the Pixar film Onward. Have you ever seen that one? No, I haven't. What's it about? Yeah, it starts off, the no spoilers, but the first two minutes, it's like this magical land of fairies and unicorns and like elves and all these different creatures and they're just it's, uh, they're at one with the land and the magic right and then technology gets introduced to them and now they start to have cell phones computers and all these different uh, technologies and you see them over the course of like a minute or so slowly losing their gifts like there's a scene of like a wizard where he's trying to do a spell and the spell's not working you know and because now they are numbing themselves getting lazy with technology and such a great commentary of mm -hmm. uh, where we are at in this current cycle on earth as humans living in this current timeline now with that said as well to your point of like the dragons or she's a fairy or elf i think you said elf mm -hmm. right uh, i totally believe in that as well like there's different i don't know the language around it either but i i even um one time in Costa Rica, I was out there for a month and I was just at a coffee shop by myself. I think it was like a breakfast place. And I started to look around at all the people there. It was very, very busy. And I started to see all their animal lineages. And I've seen it before in my life where like you can start to see how people have characteristics of different animals, but there's like a specific set of people that were straight up from like the dinosaurs, right? And all of this is uh, really fascinating. So I love hearing it. And then I'll add a few more things into this. Um, I want to speak about Moab in a second, but before I get into that, are you uh, into Dolores Cannon's work? Yes. Yeah, I figured. Really open eyes. Like there's no tomorrow and no Good tomorrow. Time. It's interesting. I had gone to see a woman who I don't think even that the friend of mine just said you need to go see this woman and she was in New Jersey still is I still keep in touch with her that's where my aunt and, Fran is that I'm going to New Jersey so I went to see this woman Catherine and if she's doing all this work and she's clearing me clearing in my house doing all this stuff and then she said okay I need to start doing some work with you and she starts doing her pendulum. She told me the story how one day she was working in her backyard and an entity appeared to her who said, we need you to start waking people up fully and we're going to give you all that you need to make that happen. But we need you to quit your job and open a storefront and be open to this. And she said, my mind was blown. Are you got to be kidding me? that how do you say no when an entity just shows up and tells you to do this so that's what she was doing and she starts going through her book and she's moving the pages moving the pages and finally she's at the back of the book because she said i've never met anyone that i need to start in the back of the book with she said you need to wake up fully and because at that point i was still trying to kind of keep my distance a bit and she the more she said it, talk to me. I said, you are talking to me like I know how to speak Japanese and I can all of a sudden start doing it. I said, I don't know what you want me to do or say. 
And she said, okay, well, there are five light beings that have been waiting for you all day. They're going to go home with you and they will put things in front of you so that it helps you remember who you are. I said, okay. Well, I go home that day and I start just playing on YouTube and all of a sudden a Dolores Cannon video pops up where she's talking about her book, The Three Waves of Volunteers. I started to cry. I literally started to cry realizing that I was one of the wave. And I totally, from that point forward, understood so much more about myself. So I love Dolores' work. Oh, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, and for anyone listening that's not familiar with Dolores Cannon, she has written, I believe, like 17 books. And she was doing hypnosis with her clients. And she accidentally, as I'm paraphrasing, uh, stumbled into a way to get into past lives, specifically off this planet in other mm -hmm. dimensions and other planets. And that is now known as QHHT, quantum uh, healing, hypno hypnosis healing technique or something like that, I think. QHHT, yeah, it's an acronym. <laughs> you know, a lot, I come from the branding and marketing. Uh, that's my background. And I remember learning uh, early in my career, like acronyms are brand killers. And there's a perfect example of why, but neither here nor there, we're not here for branding and marketing. So I do want to touch on the entity piece and revisit that. So I wrote that down as a note to come back to, but with Dolores Cannon, the reason why I brought that up is she talks about like how you have to live through all the different elements and then through living this is like the beginning of a soul. And this is like what Dolores Cannon specifically would speak about. So you start off as, you know, uh, the different elements, then you go through the animal kingdom. The last thing is you are domesticated pet in a household. Then you be, you rise to becoming a human. So my first ever like cannabis ceremony, like working with cannabis intentionally with a group of people and really creating like a true ceremony out of, uh, from it, we were all circled around. It was actually at Airbnb in Austin, Texas. And we were doing like a, a flame gazing with a candle. And at some point, I think it, it was just in between the gazing, maybe I got distracted or maybe we weren't looking at the, the candle anymore. I don't remember, but I started to look at this wall of like rocks. It was very much nature. And I started to see faces in it and I started to see a family in it. And you could see like the, the parents, you could see the grandpa, you could see like what split off to look like an uncle. And then it like, there was clear lines, like clear as day. And it was just really profound for me because that was when I was getting into Dolores Cannon's work and she talked about like life as a rock and she makes a joke like it's really slow <laughs> that a life as a rock and at the time I was like yeah this resonates there's something in me that like believes this it's definitely far out but then to have that can cannabis ceremony was like it clicked for me so that was really cool and it kind of what what you're talking about here the other thing is since you're in Utah Salt Lake and uh I recently, a couple of years ago, went to Moab. You've probably been there, the arches. Oh, yes. yes, yes. Like, explain that for people, because that's just like sleeping dragons and sleeping creatures in, in massive foundations of rocks or mountains. Like, explain for someone, you know? Oh, my gosh. I mean, it's absolutely gorgeous. You're right. And um, I thoroughly believe those are sleeping giants. There's, I mean, I, I thoroughly believe that. I was looking at one of the rocks one day and I realized it was a massive crab. I know that sounds crazy, but it was a massive, massive crab. I mean, the size of a whole mountain. And uh, Moab is absolutely magical. I've only been there, I believe, four times maybe. And we moved here six years ago. We go quite often, go down and go hiking or go um, camping or we bring visitors down there. But, uh, it just has an energy that is off the charts. And my friend who lived down there, who's also one of us, she said she was running into the need to clear the land because there was so much fighting that went down there with Native Americans. You know, we took their land there. It was absolutely, you know, their sacred place. And they, um, the land needed to be cleared from how much trauma and death had happened there. And I, I actually find that around Utah a lot. There's so much land that needs to be cleared. 
but also how many soul need to be cleared here. And this is going to get a little, I guess, touchy, but the day I learned to do, use that energy I was telling you about, called diamond energy, it's a special plasma, it's very unique. Um, I was told to look at one of the mountain. And when I looked at the mountain, I saw thousands of children and spirits, thousands. And it was one of those moments of, well, what do you do? And they said, you need to go through a ceremony and clear these children. They are stuck here. And so I started to go through the chakra and I started to clear and forgive with all the children. Um, I basically had to split myself into a hundred and, and get in front of them and give them all the energy. And then they went through the whole clearing process. And then when it was done, all of these angels, they were beautiful. They came down and took a, one child with each one and they all left. And um, it was one of those powerful experiences. But since then, I go hiking or I go camping and there's children everywhere in spirit form. And I can hear them all running around and gathering and saying, you know, we heard you're here to help us. You're here to help. And I'm like, yeah. isn't this just wild? But um, so, yeah, so that was happening in Moab also to, to get back to your question about Moab. It is beautiful, though. That is incredible. Wow. Your, your story, your experiences, uh, not stories, your experiences are incredible. That's so yeah. cool. And you mentioned diamond energy. What part of it specifically is the diamond energy? One day I was given this energy. Um, my, I have a big cheek there up there. Um, I won't go into that. That's a whole nother story. But, uh, he, he, bestowed me with this energy. I just felt it go through my entire body. And they it's called diamond plasma energy. That's all I know. And at first he said, you're to give it. And I said, I don't know how to give it. The only thing I could think of thing it was absolutely hilarious. The only thing I could think of was to belch it up. I, I don't know why, but that's how it came up. And I'd be like, what? And I would have a ball of this energy and I'd give it to whoever. And, uh, the, the, mountains that gave it like to each one of them it was very funny and finally i said this doesn't work i can't keep belching this stuff up so please teach me another way and now it just will come into my hand and i'll have it and i'm able to get it much easier play me mm. that yeah yeah i love that very cool so with, with entities you mentioned earlier that you were somewhere and you had a clear message uh, from the entity it might have been in that shop in new jersey i think it was and the entity told you to do a specific thing now i'm not the most well versed in entities so i'd love to just like riff with you on this i have had my own attachments i know people that have other attachments i've um, semi-studied on this there's one book that's coming to mind i think it's called how the arcturians are saving the earth or something like that and in this book they detail how reptilians will come in like i mean we all have some form of reptilian in us but then reptilians outwardly will come into your field and they will act like they're either not reptilians or they're a benevolent reptilian and it's like trickery. So how do you really recommend or how do you work with, with yourself to make sure that these entities that come through are for your highest and best good? Interesting you asked me that because I see them all over Utah. Uh, my husband thinks I'm crazy because I'll be walking and all of a sudden I will see either a reptilian or I'll see a Nordic. And, or just a loud out alien wearing a human skin. And I'll look and they don't, they don't, they don't right? And I'm like, babe, tell me you see that. Tell me you see those girls walking over there, that their faces are hanging in just bizarre ways. And they're not, they're not a human form. And uh, he just, he, he does that as a black. And he's like, no, Tina, you're the only one I know that sees this stuff. So, um, I've been able to keep my distance. The reptilians, they see them around Utah. They're very prominent here. Uh, but the Nordics are the most. They are everywhere, which the Nordics aren't known for being um, and malevolent. And that word is it's almost boring to me. The, the atoms, correct. Oh, um, oh, male oh, malevolent. Yeah, they, oh, yeah, that's a good point. We only talk about benevolent, which is good. Like the other one, I think, is with an M. 
benevolent. I think oh. it was, yeah, I, it, neither here nor there. But so the Nordics you were talking about. Yeah, they, um, they just exist here. I, I'm not sure why, but there are a lot. And I, I go to the elementals quite a bit, but I found it interesting when I moved from the East Coast where I used to see the elf and the fairies, the gnomes, they used to see them everywhere. I moved out here and they were nowhere to be found. I, I mm -hmm. or, And I used to wonder if it was Sith of all the ETs here, if they were kicked out somehow, I didn't know. So I finally did ask and I said, you know, why is it I don't see the elementals here? And they said, because you're not looking for the right elementals. The ones you saw before are East Coast elemental. The ones here are very different. Mm. Asked, well, what does that look, what do they look like here? And they said, the rock families, which you brought up, the mother, the yeah. I've seen them now. And you, you're right, you've seen an entire family of rocks. And I'm like, okay. And they said, um, all rocks are living beings. And there's also the rock people. And I didn't know what that meant. So I am out somewhere the other day. And I swear, Sam, this, this is absolutely hilarious. Three dwarves walk by me for the first time since moving here, the dwarves. They're not short people, but the elemental dwarves that they're like with these no white dwarves. So uh, real quick to pause there, are these humans that you're seeing through the veil and their true essence? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. They were walking by me and they, I'm going to explain them. They were shorter men that just had the build and the hair and the beard. And it's the first time I have seen that since moving here. And now I've seen three of them and I'm thinking, that's what I've been missing this whole time. I've been looking for the wrong type of elemental. Mm -hmm. And you know, that I am trying to think, what is it? Uh, there was a famous show that came out so long ago. Um, oh, but they talk about, uh, the water, Dr. Emoto, um, what the bleak do you know? Oh yeah. 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 And they explain that until you are open to seeing whatever it is. You won't see it and you really have to be open to it. So the more you open yourself up, the more you will see. Nothing happened when I opened myself up. I saw dwarves. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've had moments, you know, over the past five years or so, uh, definitely more tapped into seeing glimpses, not as clear as you're putting it. So I definitely am familiar with what you're explaining. This is bringing up a memory that I forgot, but a few years ago, I was starting to see everything specifically in nature when I would be outside as if it's inside out. And I couldn't explain that to people that when I say that, is there anything that comes up for you where you're like, I know what you're talking about? No. Oh, fascinating. Yeah. Inside yeah. out. I mean, probably the closest that come is being able to, um, see energy through the trees, like the actual tree is full on G. And knowing that I could become full energy, I learned to walk through the trees. But no thing in how I mean, well, I mean, I'm just yeah. trying to use human words to explain it. And I couldn't explain it to my friends that are into this stuff. They were just like, what are you talking? I remember at the time I had a few Wakchuma ceremonies and, it, uh, and even one peyote ceremony. And it definitely felt more like the frequency of Wachuma or even... Uh, mescaline the cactus the grandfather for sure like kind of if you've been in that frequency then you'd kind of know what that feels like and i was starting to see things differently and just um it, it, it was tied more to like inner earth it, being that inside out like kind of like just be oh we are on the surface and we're we're up like it that's what i mean about inside out and that's the best i can probably do to explain it again i'm trying to tap into experience from a few years ago that i haven't thought about much you know so. you know you say that and this is not my experience at all but i just over i, mean, I just watched um elon musk talk about this and it it was almost exactly what you were just talking about mm. he said that you know they found that new ocean under the ocean um and the depth of this second ocean is so great that they're starting, he was starting to wonder if the other side of the ocean, which is now down into the earth, 
is the complete mirror form of what we have here. Mm -hmm. And so they always talk about there's life forms in the center of the earth, and that might be. So it is like the mirror effect. And I'm curious, you just said that, and it makes me think of what he said. Yeah, it's, it's see if you have one more, if you, uh, power of three, rule of three, see if one more comes in for you, right? But exactly. yeah, I, I definitely believe in inner earth beings and worlds and all that for sure, 100%. Um, cool. So yeah, going backwards to, to the beginning, when <laughs> all this kind of started to come online for you, the way you were explaining it and how like you would be centered and then you would uh, see the town and then you'd go beyond the town and then you'd see the earth. And then the next evolution of that was like the whole universe besides just this planet. That very much reminds me of, uh, what's his name? Uh, Stephen Greer's uh, model of CE5. Are you, you familiar with this? I am with familiar with CE5, yes. I'm uh, the, that, well, one of his trips. But oh, you went on one of his no, trips? No, I said I would oh. love to. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I know, right? It's, that would be so cool. But that, it sounds like what you, your intuition as a little girl, I mean, that was almost 50 years ago and that you were doing. And I think he started to talk about CE5 at least five years. I feel like CE5 was five years ago when he came, because I know he's been on the scene talking about a lot of stuff, but I feel like that specific like way to make contact kind of was at least introduced to the general public maybe about five years ago, which is about sitting in meditation and noticing where you are in that in that room or if you're outdoors, expanding a little bit further, going to your town, maybe the state or the region, then the earth and then the stars, and then you start to play out there and make contact and then you bring them backwards back into you, you know? So it just, just kind of remind me of that, which is cool. I, I like showing that, and it, I thought it worked one time because I was doing it with a young girl who, like me, is I think she's 12, 13 now, and wanted to learn so bad. So I was teaching her some stuff, and I said, you know, I learned this process. Do you want to try to call in some contact? Of course, I was so excited to redo it. The next night, and we're on top, we're on this boat. The next night, we're looking in, out the stars, and we we start seeing this thing going across the sky. We're screaming bloody martyr because we think we have called in the ETs and they're coming to visit us. It was actually just startling. <laughs> oh, yeah. But I've been trying. I would love to actually bring that to fruition someday. That would be great. Totally, yeah. So we, we've we gotten in some really fun rabbit holes. This has been awesome. Yeah. And part of me is like, oh, don't talk about CIA and going, and going to the book and the human things but we'll see where this goes my my top of mind question is how do you go from this to the cia i mean i've never even met anyone in the cia and i guess i always thought like even after you were out you still couldn't really talk about it so just let us know what you can talk about and what that looks like in in terms of your your gifts as well like if you had to dim your light at all and i would love to just unpack this a little bit I had to dim my light any time I was in the military or the IA. There was, you know, no, 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 no. Um, that would not have gone over well. And I think in that time in my life, I was okay with that. Um, I left the CIA 20 years ago and the military before that. So I think I had reached a point in my life where I was going to open up and embrace this side of my life. I think most, I mean, I can be wrong, Sam, did you ever go through a time in your life where you decided to shut it down? and act like a, a normal person you know, normal. oh yeah i mean i had a lot of et ufo type things um as a kid that i don't even remember you know i have things that my parents have told me or channelers have told me and th the past five years is me going back to that so it was basically like shutting it down the nine years old always comes up for me yeah i've never been able to figure out why and i don't remember like a lot of people don't remember their childhood tried so many different modalities and i'm still working on like unlocking those inner child memories because they're just gone uh, and a lot of times i question i'm like am i walking you know um but yeah mine's what's yeah. that mine too and i i found out why let's go ahead 
No, yeah. So I'm basically saying like I've uh, I've shut it all down. The majority of my life in the past five years is the reawakening to it and now the unraveling. You know. Gotcha. So let me ask you this: um, around the time that you could start remembering, were you ever knocked unconscious? Oh, that's a great question. I don't know. Okay. So the reason I ask is there's been a balance that I can think of three or four times in my life where I should not have lived through what happened. The times that just, I kept going back to in my mind going, I, I mean, I'll give you just a prime example really quick. On a two lane road and I'm going back and forth with this young girl who just keep cutting me off. I keep getting the other lane. I finally am taking a left-hand turn. I get in the left-hand turn lane, which is a very short lane. And I hear this tractor trailer locking him up behind me. And I look in my rearview mirror and I can see his grill. I mean, that's how close the tractor trailer is to me. And he, next thing I know, he's ditched in the median strip. And I'm getting out of my car. She took off. I'm getting out of, I mean, getting out of my car and yelling for him to see if he's okay. And he's sitting on the ground going, how are you talking to me? And I'm like, what do you mean? Are you okay? And he's like, I, I just don't understand. I ran over your car. And I'm like, no, you didn't. Look at my car. Perfectly flying. No, nothing wrong with my car. And they said, he was the sapper shaking his head. And he said, this is not possible. I saw what I did. And I said, well, you, it didn't happen. You missed me somehow. So moments like that that just don't make any sense. And I finally asked, did I die in those circumstances? Because there was a big belief that we die so many times. In each where I don't know Shifting how you timelines, how, yeah, yeah timelines exactly. Mm -hmm. And um, so I asked one time, "Did I die?" And they said, "No, you didn't. We protected you every time." And I said, "Okay, I don't why I don't understand." And they said, "Well, do you remember when you were knocked out when you were twelve years old?" And I said, "Yes, I do. I remember being riding a bike and getting knocked out." And they said, "That's when." You are now walked into your body. Oh, wow. You're Chills. Right. right. Told them the big year for me. Yeah. You're going to go to the brain. Tell me things. Keep me. So um, my brother was with me on a couple, and he, same thing, nothing happened. So I said, did he die in those cases? They said, no. Your brother went through the same process when he was 12. And so I asked my brother, I remember something happening when he was 12. And I said, were you knocked out? And he said, don't you remember? I was laying on the road completely knocked out. I said, so that seems to be what they explained to me is when you are knocked out, there's the chance for the other. Mm -hmm. You don't want to call it an entity because that doesn't feel right at all. Oh. Guide, spirit. Um, yeah. Guiding spirit to step into your body and be with you to start you down the path. So that just makes me curious, Dan, what happened when you were knocked out? What if it was nine, whatever, but I, mean, I don't remember my childhood at all. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm curious to think about it. Let me know. Oh, I, I have. I haven't put as much of an effort into the past two years. That was more, I would say, the beginning few years of my journey and, and put a lot into that. But um, I, I have been feeling called to go back down that specific type of work. So I will keep you posted. So you would identify then as a walk-in, correct? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I, I met my family on the, the other planet. I've been there um since it was fascinating so i do but yet i'm still i'm still sentina i'm still me i just share i share a body mm -hmm. and yeah then, or with the walk-in i i definitely do makes me and think i've never said that out loud ever 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 <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Thanks for uh, not only saying it out loud, but sharing it with uh, the public on the Soul Seeker podcast. It's out there. Yeah. I mean, this goes back to your book, Empowering Truth Bombs. Uh, talk with us about that that one 
affirmation or truth bomb that you dropped earlier about like speaking your truth in in terms of like owning it what was that one again oh uh don't slouch to make others comfortable yeah exactly so when you're is there a piece of you that's like, well, no, I want to just keep this private because it's mine and I don't need to share because there's there's a good, important delineation between that, you know? I don't think it's that I I don't want to share it because I love talking about it. It's rare to find from such as yourself that won't look at me like I'm absolutely crazy for having these beautiful, beautiful adventures in my life of things that I've done. So it's, and plus my husband is very conservative. So I, I think uncomfortable for him to hear these. And then at one point I asked what to do because he was saying, hey, you're turning into the weird lady in the corner that nobody wants to go talk to because you're talking all this weird stuff. So I quit for a couple months. It was totally miserable. And then I decided to ask and I said, what do I do? Right. Because it was making him uncomfortable. And um, it was, they said to me, yes, I'll share everything and it'll be fine. <laughs> okay, I can do that. But then the day came when um, some friends of ours lost their, their young daughter, 20 year old that just went to sleep and never woke up. And uh, he was trying to console the woman. And he said, maybe you should talk to Tina because she might have some insights about what could happen. And it was the first time I'd ever heard him openly mention to anybody. And uh, I did have some thoughts on it, but like days later here, no, but um, my whole point being that he has opened up a lot more and has started to embrace a little bit of his spiritual side. He's reading the dab every day. He's trying to shift his energy, but I still don't tell him stuff I told you today. Right. <laughs> Too much. I've been talking with one of my close friends about this recently in terms of uh, synchronicities in general, just like uh, everyday small synchronicities to the larger stuff uh, happening. And what 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 is it that we want to share? And the conversation was a couple of weeks ago specifically. It's been an ongoing conversation for about six months on and off, I would say. But a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about how like it's external validation a lot of times i mean she came to this conclusion and she was sharing it with me i was like i was just on the brink of getting there but the way she articulated it really landed with me i was like yes yes that is so true because when i call you up or some of my closest people will be like can you believe this and i'm like of course like my new thing is of course thank you chris hager for that one because when i first started on this journey I, I I quickly noticed saying crazy, I had to get out of my dialect and I was always replacing crazy with wild. And that for me, what? yeah, that for me and many others was, was very impactful because that energetic charge of crazy is just, we don't want that, right? You know, for so many reasons. But then when you get to wild, you're starting to embrace it. But even the energetic of wild is like still similar to crazy being like disbelief, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas once you make that leap to, of course, it's like, no, now this is the norm. This is expectations and I'm no longer gaslighting myself. So mm -hmm. having said all this, like when we share our magic or our synchronicities, if it's someone like you and I sharing with each other, then it's kind of like, ooh, like we're feeding off of it and that's good and, and we're bringing each other up. But when we share with someone who is not on this specific path or belief systems, now all of a sudden we may start to gaslight ourselves because we're giving that energy to the other person. And if they don't receive it in the way that we were expecting them to or they can't meet us on this frequency, now all of a sudden we just naturally dim our light and we start to gaslight ourselves. So I totally agree. Like we don't need to share everything, you know? Absolutely. And absolutely. Yes, especially in a place like Utah where it has been held down by this church that's out here. I think we all know I'm talking about the Mormons, which do not. I just lit out here. But um, everyone is so controlled that this conversation, absolute taboo. A friend would, would cancel the friendship for having these conversations because it's just that uncomfortable and that far out of 
their norm. So I actually find most of the people that I connect with out here um, have left the, the church and are speaking, you know, a little more. They, What's that like? What do you mean? You know, and, and a lot of questions. And then the couple friends that I have that are really right here on our level. And, you know, they, they're amazing. Like your friend can call up friend Asia any day to week and say, saw three dwarves. I should go, really? Tell me that. Exactly. Yeah. No, I love that. So real quick, that how long were you in the CIA for? Gosh, am I only thinking about this? Okay, so the military, 14, and then um, the CIA oh. came to the tail end of that. I want to say the defense industry, maybe seven years inside the CIA, four maybe. And... um this is just a really quick CIA story, but you'll look about it. My husband and I were in Prague, and he said, I want to go to the American embassy. I'm like, oh, oh no, 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 no. We're not going to the American embassy. He's like, what, Tina, why? And I said, because what I remember being in the CIA is every country has a camera focused on the front door of every other embassy. Think about that. How many spies there are looking at all the embassies? in wow. all places in the world, especially the American embassies. So there would probably be at least 20 or 30 countries with cameras focused on the front door of the American embassy in Prague. And I said, they do, you know, they figure out I worked for the CIA and two American tourists go missing in Prague. I, I said, it's, you can't do that. And he just thought it was absolutely crazy. Again, with the crazy word. Stop that. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. But um, just the stories that I, I heard while working there, I just, I don't mess with that. So, yeah. Yeah, that, that totally makes sense. And it, how do you land in the CIA? I imagine that's something that you get recruited into. Actually, I, from being in the military, it was very easy to go into the defense industry. From there, I was a graphic artist. And again, remember I mentioned the analytical and the um, creative sides. So I was a graphic artist. I was a photographer in the military and then graphic artist in the in, uh, defense industry. And there was an opening to go inside and be a graphic artist inside the agency. Mm -hmm. But once I got in there, the team I worked for, quickly it became a um, more of an analytical position where if something went up in the middle of the night inside of one of our facilities, I had to figure out what happened. Did somebody break in? You know, what, did, what could they have gotten to? What happened? And I was in charge of the Middle East and Africa, so it was very, very busy. So the graphic artist went to the side very quickly. But the, the analytical side, I lost. Yeah. So if I'm doing math correctly, you were in the military and or CIA or something similar to that, at least 20 to 25 years, somewhere around there. Um, yeah, about 20, 20, 21 years. Yeah. What was your connection to your inner world, your spirituality and everything else? Like, did your soul feel like you were slowly dying a painful death? Uh, and were you aware of that or not? I was not. I was not. I was, I shut all of it down just to, you know, I would still have things happen to me, like seeing something before it happened, then all of a sudden it would happen and I, I wouldn't be surprised, but I didn't um, have that in my life at that time. I, I really wanted to shut that down. It would not have been acceptable there. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. And so after when I got out of all of that, which would have been around 1995, then I was able to start all it back up. And that's when I met my husband and, and left all that world and then I had to keep it all quiet because it just, it, when, it, when it started, it started. Um, I think that when my aunt taught me how to ask questions and hear answers, the way she explained it to me was very easy. It's to ask a question and then very quiet and listen. Just say, just listen. Because you're not making up what you hear. The moment you think you're making up what you hear, then you've cut all connections. 
And you will get to the point where you know that you're not making it up because it will surprise you or you'll make something up and you'll go, yeah, I just put that there. And that's kind of how it all started. She taught me how to do that to speak to some spirits that were haunting our house in Virginia. And all I did is ask, I said, I'm just curious, how did, who's here? Anybody here that would like to talk? And I heard very, four very distinct voices. And I would ask them how they passed and they would tell me stories. And I was always amazed when I'd hear these stories, you know, Civil War soldiers or different people. But one day I decided to ask, my husband needed some medical attention and we were having trouble finding somebody. And I said, what do I do? And they said, take him to this one doctor. I said, but he's a naturopath. And my husband's very much, what did that point in his natural paths? And um, they said, don't tell him. Well, okay. I have my time saved for me to not to tell him. Interesting. It's, it, my analytical mind that's going to, I'll use the word gaslight myself. If I'm doing that, um, uh, that, that practice, as soon as I have the entity tell me, don't tell someone, that's when I'm going to be like, wait, how can I trust you then? Well, you know? Yes. Yes. I hear you. Yeah. And one thing I have learned to ask um, for information from my, a guide of my highest vibration that I can handle and to meet with them and talk to them. And uh, that seems to help a lot. And you can tell if they're giving you information that doesn't feel right. And yeah, I don't, I don't listen. But um, I think the funniest time. Sorry, I keep telling you more stories. But uh, oh, I love the, it. We're here for that. Yeah. Right, right. One of the funniest times was I had asked for a new teacher. I sometimes I'll just ask for a new teacher, and uh, the next thing I know, I am in the universe, and I'm just kind of flying around because I love to fly around the universe. And I land, I'm standing in front of this like hut, little house in the middle of the universe. I'm thinking, okay, so I just go on in and out walks a little Asian man, very old, Mr. Mipsa, Mr. Uh, Misagi, Mr. Miyagi. Yeah. Misa. And he said, how may I help you? And I said, I don't know. I'm here. And I'm not sure why I'm here. And he said, did you not ask for a new teacher? <laughs> and I did it. And he's like, what do you want to learn? Now I forgot because you go into deep meditation, you forget what you had in, you know, what you were thinking of when you went in. And I said, I don't remember. Just teach me something really cool. And, and, uh, so he walked me out front of the head. He had me look at the earth and it was all sparkly and gold. It was beautiful. And he said, look closer, look closer, look closer, look closer. Until it got to the point where I recognized that the sparkles were people in a golden energy form. And he said, now do you see everyone's connected? Mm -hmm. They're all part of this one energy. And he goes, and if you were to look otherwise, the animals all have their own energy. The trees have their own energy. And we coexist together. But we are all in the human race connected by this energy. Wow. Thank you. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. I, you, you, go ahead. I was going to say, I've written a lot of the stories down. And I thought someday it'd be kind of fun to do a book just on these, these fun stories, experience. Yeah. 100%. 100%. So astral projection is like one of your uh, favorite pastime uh, activities, it sounds like. And for people listening that are like, yes, I want to try that. Or if I, I've tried astral projecting and I haven't been able to do it, like what would you recommend or what works for you? And maybe it's something you've shared with other people that work for them as well. I think too many people try to make it very difficult. I've had physical teachers try to teach me the true astral projection where you go somewhere and you can see the house. I've had teachers that have come to visit me and could tell me what I was wearing. Um, and they made it so difficult and it was disheartening because I couldn't do it. I couldn't just travel to somebody's house and walk in and see it all. I feel like that's more on this earthly plane 
And, and the shamanic studies, they teach you there are three planes. There's lower earth, which is where you meet with your spirit animals. Um, you go to the hall of mirrors. There's all these things that happen in the, the lower earth. Then there's Middle Earth, which is right outside your front door, and you can meet with the elemental there. You can meet with those that have passed. Um, I've had many journeys on, on Middle Earth. And then the Upper Earth, Upper World, I'm sorry, is the universe. And I never was taught how to do it. I just, you remember the Power Rangers? The orange thing. And that was kind of my thing. I would just take off and I'd go flying and I'd always protect myself first. I, I have learned my lesson about not protecting myself and flying around the universe. Not a good idea. And um, so always protecting myself. First, it was putting myself inside the white light. Then it became you working with the Christ grid. I don't know if you've worked with the Christ grid before, but making sure the Christ grid is around. And I put the white light around that and inside and all around. Um, and then one day they, they changed it and they made it more of a tetrahedron that is almost platinum in color. Um, and so one day my Christ grid literally shifted into this um, tetrahedron. It's a lot more points though than the regular tetrahedron. And um, so I always protect myself before I go. But I literally, you can take an elevator if you want. You can literally go into meditation, see an elevator, click a button. And off you go into the universe, or you could go up a set of stairs and meet your higher self at the top and go flying with your higher self. You know, or you can go meet your dragon and go fly around. So Beautiful, Tina. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing all this. This has been so much fun just diving deep. And, you know, we're here to talk about your book, Empowering Truth Bombs. With 250 powerful words of wisdom. And one of the things that I love about this book too is you can use it like an oracle deck. You can just like mm -hmm. flip it open and be like, okay, what is the truth bomb that I need to hear? So you this was your first book, right? Yes. It was. And, it's not B, but it was. I was and what are I the did. next five gonna be about on a high level? On a high level, the the, the next well, two more in this series okay. that you have there. And um, before I move on, I do want to mention, I didn't write any of those, those 250. Those were things that either were said to me or curated from powerful men and women who would say something that I just found so incredible that I, I kept track of everything. And I started realizing I had a lot of these and I wanted to share them because they really are about people that have gone through a situation come out the other side stronger and wiser and receive their lesson from it because that's that's a big part of it if you don't receive the lesson from what you went through then you're going to go through it again yeah. if you don't figure out what the lesson is and that's a, that's really hard to do sometimes it's also hard to figure out what the beautiful lesson is and that's important because no matter how bad the situation there is a beautiful lesson that came from it and one of my teachers here al fuentes taught me that and um, it's still the, the, the next two or two more from this series. And uh, so, cause I still have so many of that have been given to me. And also I'm open, completely open to hearing ones from your readers. If they have ones, I try not to use gurus or spiritual teachers wisdom. Uh, cause that seems to be what everybody sees all over the internet or you know, uh, the Buddha sayings or the Dalai Lama sayings, but sometimes they are powerful. Um, and so as you probably saw, I have maybe 10 in the book, but I really do try to keep it real people to real people, simple little things, and, you know, nothing big. Um, and, you know, I was laughing. One of my favorite ones that I, I thought of this morning because I was hearing somebody talk about them being so mad at somebody, and I thought, and they were gaslighting themselves. What did I do? Did I create that? You know, and they were going through all the different things and discounting their anger. And one of them in the book says, anger is the emotion that cares about you and knows how we want to be treated. I think wow. of, I know that one is to me phenomenal because we all think, oh, I shouldn't be getting angry. I shouldn't, you know, this, or they didn't really do anything that bad. But yet anger knows how we want to be treated. And I've come to that point in my life 
when I feel that, I stop. And I go, something's mm, not right here. But, um, and the other three, just very quickly, the true original came to me about 22 years ago. The universe asked me to write a book for new parents, new moms. So, uh, and that branched off into a new mom book, a new dad book, and a new parent book. And it doesn't even have to be new, but any mom, any dad, and the new parent. And I've been interviewing people everywhere I go. And matter of fact, maybe we should at some point uh, have that conversation, Sam, and I'll interview you and find out your thoughts. And um, so there'll be an entire book. I'm trying to have about 100 in-depth interviews, whether, and it's, sometimes it's somebody as young as seven all the way up to their 80s and getting their opinion on, on a question, one question. Then um, I've actually interviewed four generations, the same family, and received their answer of which awesome. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. Oh my gosh. But, um, and the whole theory behind those books is to break, how do we say this? You know, the, the theory of the seven generations that we carry mm -hmm. seven generations of our mother's history, our father's history, and it's to create a new. So the ideas in that book and the ideas in this book, truthfully, are to create change, to get out of those patterns and say, you know, I could do something else. I don't have to follow what my mother did or my father did. And uh, a real quick example, I interviewed uh, someone and he said, I have nothing beautiful to say about my mother. She didn't love me. She never touched me. She was not a good mother at all. And it was very difficult for him to even say those words. So I asked him that question that Al asked me many, many years ago. And I said, so what beautiful thing did that teach you? And of course, people get super angry when you do that at first. There's nothing beautiful that comes out of that. Blah, blah, blah. I said, no, think about it. What beautiful thing did you learn by that? And the person has to really stop and think that through. And finally, he said, it taught me how to be a better father. And he said, it taught me to tell my kid every day how much I love them and to hug them and to really be part of their life. And most fathers don't do that. Most fathers think their job is to work and, and they don't realize how important fatherly love is. So it's interesting. You know, so that's what that book is to create. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. I oh. dig that a lot. I think that's awesome, especially in that one with the generations. Uh, there's something that came up for me recently where, long story short, and I've shared this a couple times publicly, not too much, but basically last year I was seeing this woman. We lived in the same house, We and she had a she has a daughter. I forget how old her daughter would have been at the time, six or seven or something. But uh, she, the woman I was seeing started... Uh, fight she left and then blocked me everywhere right away um and broke up with me via text all the things then she tells me she's pregnant and she blocked me from the entire pregnancy gave birth to this baby boy in october and come and find out like she's done this before right with her daughter's father essentially so it's a repeating thing. And I've been sitting with the question of how is this happening for me and what's the opportunity mm -hmm. here and, and all that, which was really the birth of my new book, Overcome the Overwhelm. But where this gets fascinating is my dad recently told me that he reached out to this woman that's the parent mother of my child and was uh, trying to see the baby and have a connection with it. And after he told me this, I realized how much I've never met my dad's father, my, uh, my grandfather, uh, he passed before I was born, but there's been so many synchronicities in growing up about like the similarities between my dad's dad and myself, obviously my dad telling me that. And then I had this really profound moment with a, uh, we, we just like to affectionately call him a wizard because he's a real life wizard, a, an amazing energy worker. And I didn't say any of this. And he removed my dad's dad, my father from my field. And I was like, like, I, it takes a lot for me to cry, but I just had like tears streaming down because 
I just was like, whoa, that makes sense. And leading up to that, I had many, at least a few medicine ceremonies where I start to really question like, am I the same soul as my dad's dad, my grandpa? And then that started to link that together. The fact that he was removed from my, my, my like energetic field. Right. So, and after my dad told me, he reached out to the mother of my parent child, let's put it that way or recently, as I was reflecting on that, I was like, oh man, the pattern is repeating because my dad found out that he had a step, a half brother and a half sister in his forties or something like that. And that his grandparents were having had a relationship with the them. So now my dad's playing out the part of ha being the grandparent to having a relationship with their grandson, with the father not having a relationship. And I'm linked to the soul of my dad's dad that I've thought and felt like I am. And this was just a few days ago. And putting that together was like, whoa, that was a lot, you know? That had to be a lot. Oh my gosh, you've been hearing about him. Like, oh, could you feel a difference after you had been unlinked? Oh, oh, with the energy worker. Yeah. And that's, I felt the release, you know, no medicine or anything like that. And I, I could feel it. And that's why tears just started to stream down my face. I felt it. Yeah. Wow. That is so powerful. Seriously powerful. Right. Yeah. Interesting. So is she, was she open to your dad? Oh, the, the woman, um, she, she said the polite things that one would say and not to get air or dirty laundry, but, yeah. and then just didn't get back to him and it's been a while. So, um, that's not either, neither here nor there, not to speak bad of her or anyone else, but it's just the situation as it is, you know? So mm -hmm. with that though, I think that, that book, that's why I was saying like, that's super powerful, the generational work. I mean, all of these are, I, I really like the way you're, you're approaching them. I think it's so cool. After I did ayahuasca the first time, uh, I created a note in my phone kind of similarly, and I actually called it, I, I think I, one was like, um, I don't know, maybe brain food and the other might have been like daily doses, but I would just collect these either downloads and messages coming from me or if they were a vessel coming from someone else, very similar to the way you're explaining it. So I feel it. Well, Tina, thank you so much for coming on the show and really taking down the mask and being brave and vulnerable and sharing some of the things that you may not have shared in your life before. I appreciate it. I'm sure the listeners appreciate it. Guys, if you want to connect with Tina, you absolutely should. All of her contact information other than her email and her phone number, so basically her website and her social media <laughs> is in the show notes. And you can find the link to Empowering Truth Bombs, her new book, in the show notes as well. Tina, thank you so much Damn. for coming on the show. Thank you so much. This has been so much fun. Thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you for allowing me to be myself and not need to hide. So thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.